I think we, we are just on time, so we'll try to start now. So I'm really happy to welcome you on the IDFC Pavilion, and, and thank you for, for, for inviting us to, to present uh, today the project Assessing Company Transition with Deep Decarbonization Pathways in Brazil and Mexico. I'm Jan Briand. I'm working at the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations in Paris, and we are coordinator with ADEM of this uh, main project. I will shortly introduce the agenda of today before to, uh, to let our uh, key speakers uh, open, the, open this, this session. So just to let you know that this is the agenda of the day, so we'll, of the day, of the one and a half hour meeting <laughs> that we'll have. So we will have the chance to uh, have Stéphanie Bouzig Eschmann, that is uh, the Secretary General of the uh, Fonds Français pour l'Environnement Mondial, that will uh, be on a virtual mode, but uh, introducing and, and providing some welcoming words uh, to you today. We'll have Lola Vallejo, our, the director of uh, the, the climate program at IDUI, and Romain Poivet, the global coordinator of the ACT initiative at ADEM that will uh, provide us some uh, projects rational and, and welcoming words. The first part, uh, we will actually have two interesting presentations from uh, Emilio Lebre Ladover, professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and also coordinator of Central Clima. So thank you for being there. That will present uh, the work, the research activities that is doing on Brazilian long-term uh, long pathways and uh, presenting the challenge and opportunities for Brazil. And Daniel Buira or Jordi Tovilla, it's still, we are still maybe having the chance to have Daniel on board. So uh, that is the executive director of Tempus Analytica and that will present also the work that is doing in Mexico. On the part two, we'll have the opportunity actually to discuss the role of companies in sexual decarbonization. So we will have for that an introduction and introductive presentation of Rocio. Caicedo Torado, project manager of, at ADEM, that will uh, explain the, the rationals of the ACT uh, initiative and to discuss it with uh, key uh, companies that are part of the project. So Mr. Adilton Freitas, a sustainable manager at CEMIC, uh, Marcela Rocha, and sorry if I misspell or mispronounce the name, executive director of corporate affairs at GBS, and Vincente Torres, public affairs directors at Jovan. So thank you, and I will start directly give the floor to Stephanie, so she could uh, she could uh, just uh, start directly. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, you hear me well in the pavilion. I'm um, a little um, even uh, uh, in emotion, let's say, to to be with you, but uh, virtually we usually. Uh, the FFM is usually present at the COP, and uh, this year is a particular year, so uh, it's a great honor to be, uh, to be at least with you virtually. Uh, so for those who don't know the French facility for global environment, let me uh, provide you a few words about, uh, about the FFM. We finance pilot projects um, in southern countries uh, that reconcile the conservation of uh, the environment and the local sustainable development. Uh, the project we financed provide innovative solutions in the fields of uh, climate change, of course, but also biodiversity, international waters, land degradation, and even the stratospheric um, ozone layer and the chemical pollutants. We uh, aim to generate environmental, social, and economic benefits that make difference at a local level. So we finance projects that are initiated by um, southern and northern countries in the public and private sectors, and we work in partnership with uh, uh, other donors and international organizations. Our goal is to disseminate new methods, new practices through the finance project, and to that end, we, we support pilot projects allowing to test solutions and to learn lessons from these projects. And then we facilitate the dissemination so that the most effective solution can be spread, can be deployed by other donors in other locations or on a broader scale. The ACT-DP uh, ACT project guides private companies how they develop strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and 
it coordinates dialogue between the private sector on one side and national decision makers on the other side. Its aim is to minimize the climate impact of high emitting sectors such as uh, power generation, cement industry, food industry in Mexico and Brazil. So why does the FFM support this project? First, it contributes to the conservation of global environment as it is conceived as a laboratory for the low carbon transition in line with the Paris Agreement. Second, it features an innovative dimension combining the two approaches, an assessment methodology of companies' decarbonization strategy on one side and a bottom-up approach at the, the country level on the, on the decarbonization scenarios by sector and by country. Third, it brings science-based tools to public and private stakeholders for decarbonizing their activities. Of course, it is a starter for the deployment of public policies that really um, address the needs of, uh, sure. of their local companies. And it answers to the local challenges on this way. So finally, this methodology, we, we really, we really think that this methodology will be replicable in many other countries. And that's key for, um, for contributing to the Paris Agreement objectives and the 1.5 degrees tra um, trajectory. So I am confident that this ambitious project will provide solutions for climate action. We launched this, this project uh, back in the COP25 in Madrid. I, uh, I was there. And, uh, and I'm very happy that today you will start learning from this project. So now let's all act for climate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie, for, for these welcoming words. And actually, I, I will invite on stage uh, Romain Poivet and, and Lola Vallejo also to provide a, a few uh, welcoming words. So um, please take a seat. And actually, I think there is only one mic that I will, uh, that I will share, isn't it? Or we can take the other one, huh? Yeah. So please, uh, Lola, I will, uh, yeah, I will, uh, yes, I will invite you to start. <laughs> I'll take my masks off. I yeah. hope uh, people don't mind. Um, well, thank you very much. I'm the Climate Programme Director at IDRI, the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations. Um, I wanted just to say a few words, um, an introduction to this very important session, and maybe taking a step back. Um, as many organizations uh, and countries here, uh, IDRI is very attached to the Paris Agreement. Uh, we have been contributing as others to, to its uh, design and, and, uh, and its adoption. Um, and there are two important things in the Paris Agreement which I think are very evocative in, in the ACT project. Um, first, the very bottom-up nature uh, of the contributions that are designed and put on the table by countries. Um, and the fact that you need to define your contribution and putting in a, in a transparent manner in front of others. But uh, it is very much up to, to countries to define their own pathways and their own path to, to transition and clean development. Uh, secondly, another important aspect of the Paris Agreement was kind of opening the door of the negotiations to the non-state actors and to companies. And I think that openness was partly one of the reasons why countries felt the pressure also to commit to ambitious targets. Um, and I think we've, we've recently seen also a, uh, a flurry of um, greater attempts at uh, organizing the non-state parties' action. Um, I think in, in that context, uh, we are really very interested uh, as IDRI to take part in this project because um, not me directly, but a colleague, Henri Weissmann, is, is leading our work on deep decarbonization pathways. And it's a, an initiative that is very close to us because it's closely connected to the logic of the Paris Agreement itself. Uh, as part of this initiative, IDRI collaborates with uh, over 40 country partners, uh, some of which are here and we're very happy to see them, to support the, the development of nationally country-driven pathways to decarbonization. Um, and also not just you know the, the modeling part or the numbers part, but also how do you animate a lively discussion with stakeholders on the ground in a way that means 
it's not just a, a target, but also a process that helps countries really own uh, what a transition pathway could look like. So having set up this context, we're really delighted to be part of this project today. Uh, and I would like very much to thank uh, the FEFEM uh, and uh, the ACT um, initiative, leaving uh, Roman to give more details about um, what this initiative is about. But for us, it, it seems like we've partnered with one of the more ambitious uh, ways to include and connect the, the company's action with the country's action in a way that is consistent with the Paris Agreement goals. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm Romain Poiré, working from the, for the French State Agency of Ecological Transition, and I coordinate the ACT initiative. I'm really happy and a bit emotional, <laughs> like uh, Stephanie uh, said before, to be here, because I, I actually I would like to especially thank uh, François-Xavier Duporge, who is uh, in the audience today, because I, I met this great man uh, back in COP22, if I remember well, and we started to think about this project at COP22. And so without François Xavier, this, uh, this project won't, uh, won't exist uh, today. So really want to thank you and really want to thank the FFM to believe in this project. So I, actually, you're perfectly true. It's the original um, idea of uh, the uh, ACT initiative was to uh, st started from this uh, fact that a lot of uh, non-state actors were committed to do a lot on on on, on climate stuff like pretending to uh, uh, be greener than green and and now we are back, we are in cop 21 and i've just heard um, a few days ago uh, back 2021 <laughs> we are in 2021 thanks uh, and a few days ago uh, antonio guterres uh, made this made this statement about the fact that he will uh, implement a new panel of experts to develop the rules to understand and analyze uh, the transition plans of, um, of the non-state actors. And basically, it's what Adam with CDP, our partner of the ACT project, has uh, developed since uh, COP21 now. Uh, so we have developed all those methodologies and tools in order to really be able to understand at what extent uh, a company is really uh, developing uh, decarbonization strategy with an associated robust transition plan. So looking at uh, the, the target that the, com the, the company set on decarbonization, but as well on the, uh, all the means that the company will implement to reach those targets. And I think by uh, combining the forces of uh, the ACT initiative and the DDP project, we are now able to uh, reconnect the, 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 the ambition from uh, countries with NDCs, and we are able to uh, maybe challenge a little bit more the, the NDCs and demonstrate the fact that uh, those NDCs can be uh, much more ambitious and then that we are able to uh, connect the, the business aspect, the business perspective with those NDCs, like translating for companies what an NDC will mean uh, and what um, a low carbon world will mean from a business model perspective, in 10, 20 years, uh, 20 or 30 years uh, from now. So yeah, we have this great opportunity by working together that, in, sorry, to demonstrate that it's possible to reconnect uh, the country level aspect with uh, the, 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 the business uh, aspect, uh, perspective, sorry, in order to reinforce uh, the ambitions of, uh, of the decarbonization of, uh, of companies and, uh, and countries. And we are able, we will be able soon to demonstrate that this can be perfectly replicable and replicable in other countries. So thanks uh, once again to IDRI, FFM, to be here and to the IDFC uh, Pavilion. Thank you. No, th thanks to you, Romain and, and Lola, for, for these welcoming words, and Stephanie, that is uh, virtually present. <laughs> so th thank you for this, uh, for this introduction, and uh, I, I invite you to go back <laughs> to your initial seats. And uh, now, actually, we'll move to the first, uh, the first part uh, of, the, of the meeting today, and I will invite uh, Professor Emilio uh, to join us on stage, because the first presentation will be 
on the Brazilian uh, scenarios. And, uh, and actually, I will, uh, I will also pass you, give you this. Slide one. You, we can do it. Is that not this one? No, it's the end. No, and you need to point. You need to point this up. Yeah, like that. This. So slide one. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here. Thanks to Idri, Adam, CDP and to the FFM to support this work. Uh, we've been uh, developing the activities in Brazil, and uh, I'm Emilio Lebre La Rovere, and I'm a professor at the Federal University of Rio, where I uh, coordinate the uh, Centro Clima. And we've been doing previous exercises of, of this kind before, and we come from the national level to the sectoral level, and then to get to some benchmark indicators and milestones that can be helpful for the company level. That's uh, the part of the DDP, the deep decarbonization pathways that we've been uh, developing with uh, uh, the support of IDRI and ICI. And uh, this is a starting point for us. We have a modeling team and also a scenario building team uh, the process is stakeholder driven. We have over 200 experts working with us uh, from different uh, um, sectors at, uh, of the society, business sector, scientific community, NGOs, and also uh, government tech technicians on a personal basis in this kind, in this case. And uh, they help us to agree upon what are the good assumptions for pertinent scenarios, and then validate the results, give feedback, and identify what mitigation measures can be adopted in, in the country, in the sector level, what uh, is the viability, the cost, and the pace of deployment, and identifying the barriers to make these scenarios viable, and what instruments can be used to overcome those barriers. So uh, we work at the research team in interaction with the scenario building team, which splits in the different sectors, agriculture, forest and land use, uh, transport, industry, energy supply, waste, and also the economic overall structure because we use on the modeling framework uh, the same structure. We have a macroeconomic uh, computer uh, equilibrium model uh, developed also with French cooperation from CRED, a partner's research center in France. And uh, we have technical sectoral models for each of the sectors, of the five sectors. Uh, describing the process, the equipment, the technologies, the costs, the investments required that fit into the macroeconomic model, uh, which in turn gives the uh, constraints in terms of financial availability for funding investments for the uh, uh, low carbon projects in each of the sectors. Then we've developed two uh, scenarios. Uh, at the DDP uh, exercise this time, the current policy scenarios in a deep decarbonization scenario, of course, uh, with uh, accelerated economic growth. Uh, in the case of Brazil, tapping the potential GDP growth uh, as calculated by the economists. And uh, um, the deep decarbonization scenarios includes new mitigation policy measures on the top of the current existing uh, implemented uh, uh, programs. And this includes, first of all, a radical reduction of annual deforestation rate through enforcement of laws and regulation, and also through economic tools, conditioning credit soft loans from the government 
development banks to uh, farmers and ranchers who are in compliance with the forest code and environment regulations. And also increasing substantially the forest sinks with uh, restoration of native, native uh, forest cover and planted forests for uh, very fast growing species for energy use and industrial use. And together with that, a carbon price scheme uh, based on a cap and trade scheme for industry and carbon taxes in other sectors. And uh, the results of the taxes calculated to be consistent with the pathway that we need to get to net zero by 2050 is that one, $25 per tonne in 2030, 45 in 2040, and 65 in 2050. Uh, this, for instance, in 2030 is um, nearly half the lowest uh, level, the bottom level of the uh, recommendation from the, from the Stiglitz Stern Commission on Carbon Pricing. That means that in Brazil we can reach net, uh, carbon neutrality uh, at a very lower cost than in, in the world as a whole. And the important thing are the complementary policies, because carbon pricing needs complementary policies. In this ca case, fiscal neutrality, uh, uh, revenues from the carbon pricing schemes go back into the economy. They don't uh, increase the tax burden, and uh, they are used to reduce labor tax. This increased employment generation in the deep decarbonization scenarios and also compensate poor households uh, for the increase in general price level with the carbon pricing. And um, you know that in Brazil, you've seen the emissions in the past and the green share is the uh, deforestation emissions from uh, uh, land use change and forests. You've seen that from, uh, say, 2004 to 2010, there was a sharp reduction. So we are confident that what we are proposing is uh, viable. Also in this uh, deep decarbonization scenario, it was already achieved in the past. In this period, Brazil was able to cut down 1 billion tons of CO2 equivalent per year in the emissions, which is uh, a really re remarkable result. And so that's why we can dare to present such uh, pathways that we see as uh, feasible from the bottom-up discussion, sector by sector, measure by measure, uh, mitigation action by mitigation action. We uh, can go and reach net zero with that green pathway uh, depicted here. So. We, in this project with uh, ADEM, we've got uh, three sectors, and the power sector was one of them. Uh, what are the implications? What is happening in the power sector uh, within this general scenario framework? Uh, we already have in Brazil over 80% of power generation from renewables, so you, you, have, uh, you already have, say, by uh, even 2015, which a very dry year where emissions were higher because of more thermal power generation, this is 68 compared with 1,500 with, of total emissions. So we are talking about uh, less than 3% of uh, the country's emissions. And still, we can go down to net zero up to 2050, increasing renewables. There is a Huge potential still to be tapped in wind power, solar power, biomass, uh, and some additional hydro. And the great fac emission factor, you see that's already very low and can be made uh, uh, net zero, uh, except for the self-generation uh, diesel sets that uh, in remote parts of the country. Now, uh, energy conservation, energy efficiency is also important. So you see that in the DDS, we have a 6% lower demand, particularly uh, thanks to greater energy efficiency in industry mainly. 
And in terms of other indicators of the uh, power sector, you see the share of renewables, all the NDC targets that were spread out for the energy sector in 2015 are already being met today and can go even uh, much further in terms of the share of renewables, including new renewables, not only hydro, uh, up to 2050. And you see also there is some electrification of energy use that also helps to increase the renewable share in the total energy mix. Then the second sector was uh, uh, cement industry. And we had in cement industry uh, the, these results increasing uh, much lower, uh, much uh, slower the emissions in the DDS than in, um, in the current policy scenarios, but still some growth. That means that emission is not going down in, in, in the uh, industry and in cement uh, manufacturing. And this is obtained through a, a number of actions, energy efficiency, first of all, also reducing the ratio of clinker to cement, uh, and also to increase the use of biomass and waste, particularly municipal solid waste that's now going to increase thanks to new environment regulations approved that allow for burning refused deri derived fuels in uh, uh, cement kilns. So we got uh, emissions can be more or less kept to the same level that we had, for instance, in 2015, in not increasing in the DDS. So the stability in the emissions is possible. Finally, the third sector is uh, agriculture and uh, particularly spelling out the meat production chain, the beef production chain. And what we see here, the uh, results, of course, there are many sources of emissions. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the contribution of enteric fermentation, you see these are the pizzas uh, in scale for the uh, CPS and for the DDS. And we see that enteric fermentation is very hard to go down. While we can uh, cut very sharply the emissions from deforestation and increasing the sinks, you have also the removals uh, pizza. But uh, we can anyway go from uh, 368 to 250. 82, that means anyway, something we are talking about a reduction of uh, roughly 40%. But uh, uh, anyway, it's not uh, that easy. And we see in, in the beef production chain, what we can do is uh, more intensive uh, production systems, integrated also uh, cattle ranching with forest uh, growth and uh, recovered. There is a lot of degraded land and de degraded pasture land that can be recovered. And also the average stocking rate, which is very low, you see that uh, in, in Brazil, in terms of, of heads of adult cattle per hectare can be increased. And this uh, allows for the same meat production increasing in the scenarios uh, but with a lower, uh, um, a lower hurt. And uh, this is also thanks to shortening the life cycle of the animal with good quality, but the average goes down from 37 to 27 months. So the amount of uh, methane emitted per animal is much lower, and then we can have these reductions. Uh, the slaughter uh, age is uh, redu reduced uh, as well. So thank you very much. Uh, we don't have time for many details, but the key findings, I don't see Daniel around, so I can borrow some of his time. That's all right, Jan? Yeah? <laughs> anyway, for the key findings, of course, there are many possible pathways to be designed. 
uh, for a country like Brazil to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. This is just one among them. Uh, but it was actually a collective construction by a, a number of experts and also with validation from stakeholders. I think this is the most uh, crucial part of it because if the, the, there is no buy-in of this scenario design, then it will not go into action. And what we've been seeing in Brazil this year is that the business sector, the NGOs, and the social movements have stepped in, uh, up in terms of the climate change problematic, and also the subnational levels, many governors of state were very uh, key to come here and not only make the announcements. I think that this kind of effort, like the ACT methodology, the uh, DDP methodology, are crucial now that all these announcements that we are hearing in this COP really can uh, be uh, 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 concrete, uh, tr translated into concrete uh, measures and mitigation actions and get to results. So, in the case of Brazil, we don't need any technological or breakthroughs. The available technologies can do the, uh, the job. And uh, the key thing for a developing country like Brazil is that we are not jeopardizing economic and social development uh, due to cutting down emissions. We can uh, have a win-win situation if we have those complementary policy measures uh, to deal with carbon pricing. And uh, finally, the carbon price is very low, as I already called your attention. So that means that we can not only uh, meet this target, but also have a good contribution in terms of uh, ITMUS, that means international trade mitigation outcomes to help other countries to decarbonize as well. And uh, the, main, the key uh, steps, the key short-term measures to start now, because 2050 starts today, the long-term starts today, is to work First of all, on the low hanging fruit of cutting down deforestation, which does not harm economic activity, and putting in place the incentives and also the carbon price scheme with allowing some compensation for the industry of, for offsetting emissions through uh, growing trees can also be uh, part of the solution. And finally, uh, the carbon pricing scheme. This kind of exercise, at the end of the day, provides us, supplies us with decarbonization milestones and benchmark indicators that we can use at the business level, at the company level, to monitor, to report, and verify the progress uh, towards achieving targets, which will uh, crucial in the next years. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Emilio. Thanks a lot, and and you can, uh, if you want, you can you can stay on stage, and we will directly actually move to the presentation of Mexico, uh, and I will ask my colleague Jordi Tovilla, that is online, to uh, take the floor, and present the the deep decarbonization pathways that have been developed in the con in the Mexican context. Yes, we see the slide, and I don't know if we can hear Jordi. Hello, hi everyone. Yeah, we can I don't hear know you. If you can see my presentation great yeah we can see your presentation okay well thank you very much and uh hi everyone uh i'm glad to glad to glad to say hi um i'll be talking about the uh, pilot activity project which is happening in mexico on this side um um, I perhaps should give a bit of context uh, of what, who we are and what the organization does, uh, then how we built this uh, full economy vision on the transformation of the, towards deep decarbonization for the, full, for the full economy and the whole country, and then how we've derived uh, you know, sectorial insights from, uh, and pathways from this whole vision into uh, you know, specific sectors that we work in this project, namely in Mexico, are power, uh, urban passenger transportation, and cement production. 
and just finish with our key messages and keynotes on what we've learned so far in this project. Uh, Tempus Analytica is a non-for-profit research organization, a think tank that we created back in 2016 to uh, basically keep on doing this analysis uh, that, uh, of deep decarbonization for sectors and the whole economy in Mexico. Uh, we were part of the original team from the chapter, the Mexican chapter of the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project that helped form uh, COP in Paris. And um, we had experience advising international organizations and governments on uh, the design of the long-term strategies and the institutional planning and organization and coordination that you need around to do this. So uh, what we've been doing in all these years, um, much of these projects in partnership with IDRI and ADEM and all the other French uh, support and international partners, is uh, build a basically uh, approach a uh, vision of the future in which Mexico actually hits uh, the Paris Agreement targets and uh, work backwards in, to, in order to see what is needed from the present conditions to reach those uh, such futures. Uh, we've been doing this as we're a small organization, we've been doing this in a modular approach tackling probably the most relevant topics we could identify in each time. For example, the uh, uh, natural gas uh, booming infrastructure that was previous decade in Mexico, or whether it fit it fitted in the in the long term strategy of things, uh, or all the way to, you know, that, that it required expertise and specialized energy modeling systems. Um, whereas some other exploration of scenarios in sectors we do with say ad hoc tools that are designed to be transparent yet simple in order to describe these transformations in the long term. Um, so what we've ended up with is a bottom-up description of what are the changes and the narrative of changes towards 2015, which is basically our, our main target. Uh, uh, having a lot of uh, you know, uh, different ways to explain this transformation and different indicators helps engage with different stakeholders uh, in each of the sectors, which is important to construct a, 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 a you know, a productive dialogue out of this. Um, the, um, the, this, is, this is the comparison of our current uh, most uh, work up scenarios. The one on the left is current policy scenario. The one on the right is the deep decarbonization pathways. Um, this is uh, in, in megatons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, from present conditions, uh, the deep decarbonization actually reaches more than 90% of reductions of net emissions uh, compared to a 2020 level. Um, this is mainly done by, uh, you know, having zero electricity from hugely uh, increasing renewable sources into the matrix, uh, increased electrification of all energy uses as well as energy efficiency across all sectors. Uh, improving the urbanization paradigms and dynamics uh, in which to reduce the transport demand as we see now many people moving every day just commuting to, to reach their jobs and um, um, yeah, life support sources. Um, um, so uh, there's also uh, some room for uh, you know different ways in which we can think the, the energy industry particularly and many of the industries around uh, will revolve around the transformations of industry will revolve about such transformation of energy, either electrification as well as new incumbent new vectors in the system, such as hydrogen and a high potential of renewables and more electricity. Uh, as, as well, we've done a previous uh, or preliminary study on what should happen to the um, a follow sector and the emissions from the land and with some with some uh, projections on how to stabilize you know uh, emissions from agriculture and, and livestock while increasing a bit of the uh, the things we have in natural forests uh, this first vision has helped us shape uh, you know sectorial particular sectoral evolutions and, and sectoral pathways uh, in the case of electricity, well, it's, it's obvious that the central role you will have in decarbonizing all of their sectors as you clean up the matrix, the electricity generation matrix, and electrify all uh, other uses of uh, energy across sectors. So that's, that's how you basically bring emissions in all other sectors down. So that's, that's, that's key. 
but also we've identified uh, by providing motive power with less uh, waste heat. Oh, many uses uh, were previously on combustion. When they're electrified, they will gain a lot of energy efficiency that happens in transportation and in some industrial uh, applications. Um, so uh, Mexico has these vast and huge renewable resources, particularly solar and, and, and a large amount of wind power already identified. Um, so it's clear that we can you know, provide the electricity with those resources, but they will have to have a boost on investment and development in the coming, in the coming decades, as you can probably see from the two charts comparison uh, on the current policy scenario. Uh, basically, we have uh, an investment on gas uh, mostly, uh, which is uh, you know, growing at that recent trends. And we'll have to ramp up that dramatically to increase uh, the you know, uh, electric generation from renewable sources um, while keeping uh, natural gas investments at, at, at their and, and, um, infrastructure at, uh, at its current level. Uh, we've seen that um, having a, such a huge amount of renewables uh, obviously poses some uh, intermittency questions but uh, balancing, you know, across the whole country and uh, storing and transforming energy uh, electrical uh, surplus at some hours uh, within, for example, uh, batteries or even, you know, going to the whole hydrogen and synthetic fuel um, production chain might be worthy and uh, of strategic importance if you consider some other niches difficult to to carbonize. So this is just a simulation of what of day in which supply is met with demand and how you can actually balance all these basically uh, almost full renewable uh, energy matrix. Um, in passenger transportation, uh, it will be very important to, to change the urban structure. Now, uh, opportunities, jobs, uh, education, and all services are very unequally distributed in Mexican cities. So a lot of people need to commute every day to reach them. Um, as we you know, reduce demand, we also need to encourage a huge model shift to basically uh, move people from private vehicle usage to uh, public systems, which transport people in way more efficient ways. Uh, and that can also be electrified uh, massively. Uh, well, everything will be electrified in order to reach you know, zero emissions in this, in this transportation uh, in this sector. Um, um, but it, what, what is interesting is that, you know, the combination of all the technification and better efficiency when, you know, dealing with mobility per se, um, drives ener energy consumption of energy demand on this scenario down for 50%, you know, when compared to a, a current policy scenario. So that's, that's very interesting and of course has a lot of to do with energy security when you think of the, uh, lowering in oil field demands that uh, we currently import mexican ports around you know half or perhaps more than the gasolines it's it's used in transportation so um as you can see uh, this demand for liquid fuels will be seriously reduced in the terms of gasoline and diesel and some other niches that uh, are difficult to electrify so, uh, like uh, uh, aviation can benefit from having this nascent industry um, um synthetic fuel, zero carbon fuel industry uh, produced with excess um, ele um, ele renewable electricity. Uh, finally, we explore cement, where we do have also, we've managed to uh, simulate uh, emissions reduction, uh, notably uh, almost 80% versus a current policy scenario. And in, in this case, we do uh, we see that either clinker reduction and capturing emissions is uh, the, the same as in the case of Brazil, capturing emissions from the calcination process is uh, important. Um, um, uh, but also this, uh, this scenario allows for an exploration on what would happen if we reduce demand due to better design and construction practices that require less concrete at the end in, in each building or the use of the better use of and more efficient of, of buildings themselves that they can be readapted rather, rather than rebuilt, um, um, you know, extending life term of the concrete produced. Um, uh, so, uh, and also in this uh, scenario, obviously, it'll be important to decarbonize energy. 
Uh, one of the things we've done is to you know, reduce the use of coke, uh, residual fuel oils, um, to change it a bit for the natural gas, and the natural gas that it was used then is uh, uh, substituted with a bit of biomass and solar thermal and electricity. Uh, but of course, this is uh, this is in the stage of exploration. We haven't really modeled dedicatedly what happens in cement, and we're just iterating this vision as we come. Um, in the case of electricity and transportation, we do have more, um, you know, dedicated modeling that can help us understand how the balancing of the whole energy system works around these new uh, scenarios. Uh, one of the things, uh, or many of the things we've, uh, we've uh, taken out from all of these, uh, these uh, studies and analyses is that the transition has many benefits, uh, we call the ben co-benefits or benefits, which are very important. Uh, um, it could actually uh, be the basis for a new development paradigm in which, uh, you know, the Mexican society embraces a bit more a knowledge uh, and, and, and high value based society. Uh, some sectors are already into that track, but uh, it'll be interesting to bring the whole of the society into that as well. Um, and this, can, this, this vision and certainly this transition presents with uh, an equal opportunity to do that. Um, and one of the key messages is, uh, and particularly with the private sector in, in, in this project, is that these kind of bottom-up scenarios and narratives of, of what happens in each sector uh, helps a lot to visualize, you know, what, what, what the changes need to be and um, what needs to be on the ground as we progress into different decades. So that uh, gives a clear vision uh, of, for companies to either use it as benchmark or compare themselves to, and then that we can have uh, further development of the methodologies we use to evaluate and assess their own transition. So that kind of dialogue has already been built uh, and that's very constructive. And of course, as these, all these scenarios are being backcasted from you know, hitting the, the, the Paris targets, they provide this, uh, this vision unambiguously. Uh, and that means you know, net, net zero carbon, uh, basically for the economy for 2050. Um, so that, that's a way we can um, create this dialogue and um, bring more people into the table and discussing what it means, what, what this means and what needs to happen. So thank you very much for your attention. No, thanks. Thanks to you, Jordi, and remotely. So uh, unfortunately, we have not seen your face, but uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, so you can see a bit of Jordi. Uh, and I will directly actually pass the floor to Fernanda, that, that, is, uh, that will moderate remotely uh, the next session. And Fernanda, if you can uh, hear me, I will uh, just pass you the floor and, and let you uh, start the second part of the, of the meeting. Thank you, Ian. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so, hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here um, at home in Brazil, but sharing this moment of reflection and lessons learned about this project with you. My name is Fernanda Colech. I am a Corporate Engagement Manager at CDP Latin America. And for those that are not familiar, CDP is a non-profit organization and we aim to promote environmental action by engaging investors, companies, cities, states and regions. And uh, together with our partners, I'm also part of the implementation of the project in Brazil and Mexico. And I will be moderating this session about the role of companies in sector decarbonization. Uh, before we move to the panelists, I would like to invite Rocio Torado uh, from ADEM. She will briefly introduce a little bit about the ACT methodology and the activities that we have implemented as part of the projects. Lucille, the floor is yours. Hello. Thank you, Fernanda, for that introduction. So I'm Rocio Caicedo Torrado, project manager at ADEM of this uh, project. Um, so maybe if, if you could share the slides. Okay, so we have um, had an introduction of what is uh, the Deep Decarbonization path, um, Pathways Initiative. 
and um, Romain introduced a little bit about the ACT initiative, Accessing Low Carbon Transition. And this is a graph that um, intends to show what is the synergy that we are creating uh, with, between these uh, initiatives. So uh, we have the DDP initiatives that is, is designing these country-driven scenarios and, and quantifying um, these decarbonization pathways, giving um, companies and other stakeholders uh, a broad vision of the transformation of the sectors um, in, within the context of um, each country. And then uh, we are um, enriching the analysis of the ACT um, assessments um, by using these pathways as one of the main uh, benchmarks of the analysis. Um, so the ACT initiatives will, um, will evaluate, it will assess if um, a company is ready um, or how ready it is to transition to a low carbon economy. And in the case um, of this project, we are using not um, regional scenarios, but really scenarios built, um, developed for a country, and specifically for a country and for the sectors that we have uh, chosen for the project that are um, power generation, cement, um, urban passenger transport for Mexico, and um, meat production for Brazil. So as you see, uh, we, the, 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 this, this synergy uh, intend to inform the company and all uh, other stakeholders as investors and policymakers, not only on what are the transformation of the sectors, but also on how the company can um, just be more in alignment with um, uh, the mitigation uh, objectives of the Paris Agreement. Next slide, please. So, ah, <laughs> thank you, Ian. <laughs> that would be better. So, um, we have, there are four work streams on this project, and we started at the end of 2009, so just before the pandemic, and uh, it's been um, challenging, but quite rewarding, because now we can share, like we have done during this time. So first we have as one of the missions is this construction of decarbonization, uh, deep decarbonization pathways that have been, um, been the work of IDRI, COPE and Tempus Analytica. And um, then uh, we are starting, we are ending right now uh, the assessment of companies um, strategies for um, uh, in Brazil and Mexico, so we have um, chosen 20 companies to do this work of assessment. Um, we will have today two voluntary companies to share more about this experience. And uh, um, in total, we are assessing 20 companies, 10 in Mexico, 10 in Brazil, and more or less three to four companies from each sector. The results are not yet, have yet been given to the companies, it's on the works, but, um, well, I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we will have the, the broad results, um, aggregated results by the end of January, next January. So we have also another mission that is knowledge transfer and communication at national level, and this has been um, implemented through the dialogues um, organized by each uh, DD partner, so by Tempus Analytica and COPE, where they have presented these um, scenarios of decarbonization for each sector to um, um, a group of, um, of companies and stakeholders and uh, inviting them to join the discussion. And other part of the knowledge transfer um, mission is that we have been training um, companies and also um, Companies, um, we have been creating an ecosystem in, in both countries, um, training on the ACT um, framework, companies, uh, consultants, um, and 
we are starting now with um, policymakers. But hopefully by the end of the project, we have been also, like we will be able to train uh, two um, investors and, and um, some civil society. Yeah, as a whole, and the last um, the last mission is communication at um, regional and international level, and uh, for that, well, we are here, so we are doing our job. We are communicating about the project, and uh, in by the end uh, by April uh, of next year, we'll be organizing events at the regional level and at the national level to share the results of, of the project. Okay, uh, so just to introduce, because then we will uh, um, hear what companies has to say. So what we are doing uh, with companies is we are assessing uh, their uh, low carbon strategies using the ACT framework. And this, um, this framework is, is guiding, guides the analysis uh, of, of five questions guys guide this analysis. So uh, what is the company planning to do? What is the company planning? How the com is the company planning to get there? What is the company doing um, at the present? What has the company done in the recent past? And how actually all of this is if all of this is, is, is consistent. And, thus, um, and to answer to those questions, so the ACT uh, framework uh, will respond by, a set of in, in, by, by answering a set of indicators, performance and narrative indicators uh, that will cover um, the, operations, um, the, the operations of the company. So we will take a look at uh, targets, material investments, uh, intangible investments, performance of products, management, suppliers, clients, policy engagement, business model, to really an analyze how the company is, is, uh, is doing its transition to a low, low carbon economy. And uh, then um, we will take a look at, a nar um, at the narrative of the company, um, at its business model, um, its credibility, reputation, and risk. So we are going to review all the data we have on the company, not just on the performance part, and, 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 and respond to that. So how actually the company is um, behaving. Um, and then we have uh, a third segment of the analysis, that is the trend score, and it says it's the forecast of future changes. So we are going to take a look at if in, in, uh, in the near future, uh, the company, uh, how is the transition of the company? Is getting better? Is not getting better? And uh, this is, uh, yeah, it's more, um, let's say, um, it's up to the analyst, anal analyst to take a look at the indicators of future and, um, and, see, um, and, and see if the company actually is in, in, the, good, in the good path. And so as a result of this uh, act assessment, the company will get a score that will give us an idea of where um, uh, the company is, is it at the moment. And uh, so it will give uh, on the performance, the score will go from one to 10, on narrative from, a, from letter A to E, and on the trend it could be just a plus to say that the company is in the good, it's going to get better. Uh, a minus if it's not in the good path and or unequal is the analyst thinks it's not going to change. So just to give an introduction and I will leave the floor to the companies uh, to share this experience uh, on, the, on the project. Thank you. Thank you, Rocio. Uh, indeed, I think one of the topics that we want to highlight here in this discussion is the connection between these two methodologies. Uh, but now it's time to hear a little bit from the private sector and what these two companies from the transportation and energy sector are doing. So moving to the discussion, I'd like to invite uh, two speakers for today. So Vicente Torres, Public Affairs Director at Urban, if you can please go to the stage, and also our second speaker, uh, Adjeri Tonfeitas, who is the Sustainability Manager at Semig, an energy company in Brazil. Unfortunately, uh, JBS could not join us for today, but uh, they had some 
conflict of agenda, but we can move with these two companies. So thank you first for accepting our invitation. And uh, to start this discussion, I would like to invite you both for a quick introduction about your companies. And if you can please detail a little bit on the climate change strategy you are implementing uh, and the targets and plan of actions you have for the following years. Uh, we can start with Vicente from Urban and then move to Adialiton. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Fernanda. Uh, I have a couple of slides to share with you because I think it's important that uh, we introduce ourselves as Urban. Uh, Urban is a Mexican startup. Um, and what we do, the next slide, please. Is, ah, ah, so, awesome, thank you. So uh, Urban is a, it's a, it's a technological company. We have a technology that enables uh, shared mobility systems. We, we seek to integrate mobility patterns uh, that we have been studying uh, based on the needs of individuals and organizations. And uh, we're doing that through a platform that aggregates shared vehicles. So when we start our, um, our endeavor with, uh, with the AG methodology, we said, OK, so let's, uh, let's transition Urban towards a low carbon company, whatever that means. Because uh, we are a young uh, startup that uh, it's growing. It's, uh, it has a good idea. It has some uh, interesting uh, uh, people who wanted to, to help us to grow. Uh, but, but we needed like, some guidance about, OK, what's it, what is our role in the environmental thing that we are living here? So uh, one thing that we, that we found when we started this, this, uh, this assessment is, OK, directly, Urban is not a major greenhouse gases emitter. And, and, and maybe uh, our real potential lies in the avoided emission that its own activity can foster. We, we perform a, a survey um, in which 51% uh, of our users said that they, they have a car, a private car, but they, they do not use it because they have the, 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 the chance of using urban. So we say, OK, so the more vans that we put out there, we, it will be less cars uh, uh, on the streets. OK. so. Let's, let's try to do that, but careful. And this is something that we have learned uh, from the ACT uh, assessment. OK, do it, but carefully, because you, you will grow, and you will have also bans on the road. So let's avoid emissions, but do not forget your own growth and your own control of your own emissions. So that, that, that has been very interesting for us. So um, we have been following the path that Rocio just said about trying to give answer to these questions. Uh, it has been very interesting for us because, as I said, being a young, uh, energetic startup uh, with, with, uh, with, a, with a lot of uh, anxiety to, to, to growth, it's important to have these questions raised and to really put this uh, in a framework that allowed us to grow uh, in a responsible manner. So um, the idea was, OK, what does the company plan to do? We want to grow, and we want to promote the shared mobility principles and the shared mobility actions in the in the major cities of Latin America, so that's that's our our main goal, but responsibly. So, how do you plan to get there? Uh, we have uh, four uh, business verticals in which we are giving intra-city services, inter-city services, uh, uh, private mobility services, and also some uh, private rental services. So we want to develop that, and uh, we want to fit into the mobility ecosystems of the cities. Uh, we want to be responsible. We want to be respectful with, uh, with, with uh, how the cities are planning their own mobility. So uh, we are, we are uh, planning properly our growing in those uh, uh, business areas. Then uh, what is the company currently doing? Well, we're, we are um, consolidating our, our business model right now. Uh, it, it needs to be sustainable, financially sustainable, uh, under, the, under the terms of, uh, of responsibility with the, with the environment and also with the interaction with the, with the other players on, in, the, in the mobility ecosystem. So uh, uh, this is what we're doing, and, and, and we are getting ready to the expansion of the rest of Latin America. We're about to do that now. 
Um, so what has the company done in the recent past? Uh, we have a very interesting story regarding uh, COVID with us because uh, we, it, it, we had to change really, really dramatically uh, some of our verticals uh, when this happened. And we, what we have found is that uh, we can enable uh, a more efficient network of vehicles working in different verticals in the most uh, uh, efficient way. So we can give the most kilometers uh, in the last uh, vans moving more people. Uh, so we can really uh, minimize our impact. Uh, also thinking about electrification and more stuff, but really thinking in how the, the, the technological algorithms can help us to really plan something that works together as a system and as a network. So. Um, uh, so this is, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, our plans and our actions, uh, uh, we want to be aligned, and this is what ACT has helped us, uh, to, to really become a tool that can really uh, help to fulfill the Paris agreements, uh, uh, basically, basically is that. So uh, we want to thank uh, ACT and DDP and ADEM and, and, and all these initiative because it really has helped us to put a framework on our growth and to really understand that it is not only about growing, it's about growing together, respecting all our environment. So uh, we are going to continue to work on that. And now we feel more confident because we feel that we have this, this uh, uh, overseas of, the, of, 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 of this methodology. Thank you. Fernanda, back to you. Thank you, Vicente. And now I'm moving, just conscious of time, moving to Adieliton. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, for Fernanda, for the invitation. I was here for the invitation to, to be here and to participate in the event and to participate on uh, the, the methodology, to apply the, the methodology at CEMIG. Could you put the presentation, please? Oh, no. no but it's... Oh, yes. Uh, I will talk, tell a little bit about our climate change strategy, but first of all, first of all, I will tell a little bit, tell a little bit about my company. Semig is an integrated company in Brazil, uh, in the state of Minas Gerais. Minas Gerais state is almost the same size from France, and we have uh, nowadays uh, 5.8 gigawatts of, of energy uh, with uh, two 82 power plants. 75 hydropower plants, uh, six wind power, wind power plants, and uh, one solar power plant. And we start to, 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 to the, the, the decarbonizate pathway when in 2019, we closed our thermal power plant. It's the most important pathway, the fourth important step that we did related to climate change, related to, to, to decarbonization. And, and we have more, almost 80,000 uh, kilometers from transmission lines, and almost 550 kilometers from distribution in, in, in Brazil, in, in, in Minas Gerais states. Uh, when, when we think about uh, climate change, we think about climate change as opportunity. Or is it opportunity for, for us as a business, or the opportunity to the clients, or the opportunity to a society? This is the, the way that we think about climate change. And we start, about, uh, we start thinking about, re the, as the professor said, reducing energy consumption. And we have a strong uh, energy efficient program that we replace old equipment to new one with equipment more modern and more with more efficiency, uh, mainly in hospitals, in, in schools, and public schools, and low-income communities. It's a very important way that we think about. As we already is 100% uh, clean, uh, clean energy, 100% renewable, we think that the most important uh, scope nowadays for us is scope two. And scope two for electric utilities, it's very important because the losses. We have a lot of losses. We have almost 500,000 500, kilometers from lines and more than 90 million of clients. And we need to deal with losses. This is a very huge problem for us. And we have a plan to monitor and inspect public lighting. It's very common in Brazil sometimes the public lighting stay turned on on the day, during the day. 
and they will have uh, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, uh, illegal and unauthorized connect connections in our, uh, our system. And then it's a very good, uh, very, very, very important thing that we need to, to deal with. Uh, on the other hand, with uh, planning our, our strategy in the future, looking into the future, we, we, we have a, a strategic plan that we intend to, to spend our installed capacity in one gigawatt until 2015, uh, investing almost uh, one billion dollars and uh, in solar and, uh, and wind power. And uh, I think, I expect that uh, the DP give me the answer, but it's related to the model that Professor said and showed to us. And then I think we are in the pathway to the, the decarbonization and the net zero in 2015. And we have a, a company, we think that uh, we need to provide a solution for our clients in the retail clients. And uh, we have a company called Semig Sin that, uh, that uh, is investing almost one billion reais, uh, 200 million dollars in project of distributed energy, PV solar, uh, to sell energy for clients. And uh, we believe too that it's important to provide the, that the way that our clients to reduce their energy, their, their footprint in energy, and we, we uh, in, in this, this, we provide a renewable energy certificate direct to our clients, to that, that, that our cl clients uh, it can show, it can uh, allow the, our clients to prove that they renew the renewable origin of our energy. Then it's good for, the, for us because we, we show that we are uh, uh, selling a special energy. Maybe we can get a special price of this energy, and it's very good for our clients that can show that they are using a renewable energy, zero emission and, uh, and energy. And I think the last step is very important. We talk about too, it's not the program obje object objective, but we need to talk about too. It's the adaptation. We are investing a lot in adaptation. Uh, one example here that uh, we uh, we are intend to, to do 100% of the city uh, of the city of that uh, our state with two channels of supply because the uh, extreme events can happen and uh, a tower can fall down and the clients continue having energy provide for the another the another supplier. Then it's that the way that we think that uh, climate change it can be an opportunity. Opportunity for good, good service for clients, for example, here. Opportunity for the business with uh, uh, IREC, for example, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, our capacity is uh, increasing. And, and uh, 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 opportunity for society that uh, our program related to energy uh, efficient program. That's it for now. Thank you, Adeliton. Thank you very much for your great presentation. I think that uh, it was interesting to see how your both companies in different sectors are facing these uh, discussions uh, on future transition and climate change. I think that one of the main topics and concerns that we are looking at this project and also looking at CDP, it's how companies are preparing this themselves for this future transition, uh, how ready they are in terms of investments, allocation of human resources, allocation of capacity for this future transition. So I'd like to hear a little bit from you, Vicente, how you think, uh, what are the main challenges for this future transition in the transportation sector? You mentioned a little bit that uh, urban wants to grow. So how do you plan uh, to have this readiness uh, for this? future transition at, at Urban. Yeah, well, as I said, it's, uh, for us, it's very critical to understand how, how our growth will impact uh, the, the environment. We don't want just to rely on the fact that uh, the more urban, less carbon emissions, that is true, but we cannot put together this with the fact that we are gonna put more vehicles on the road. So uh, when we do that, I mean, we're going to put more vans on the road, which will mean less vehicles uh, in it. But uh, if we think just in ourselves, we need to think in putting these vehicles in, a, in the most efficient way, working in a networking environment, uh, using the, the state-of-the-art technology to really uh, be there working in the most efficient way. Um, 
and and of course uh, searching for new technologies electrification yes of course it's uh, it's uh, it's there as a possibility although i must i must say that that electrification of vehicles of 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 medium vehicles it's not really a reality right now at least not in in latin, in latin america we have been searching uh, to really electrify our our fleet and there's no electrical vehicles for us to 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 do it so that's a reality so everybody is, is is pushing and talking about the electrification of vehicles there's not there's no such thing uh, you need to put it on uh, in uh, in a in a waiting list uh, you need to wait uh, 6 to 10 months uh, there's no vehicles there so that's a challenge so it's, it is not as easy as to say let's electrify the fleet and let's just go to that there's that's not available right now it will i hope but uh, in the end uh, we we need to grow responsibly yes giving all the all the good things that shared mobility will have at the end we think that the balance will be much more positive uh, uh, but we we want to keep it uh, responsible in that way okay perfect yeah and now Adialito, i think that uh, you mentioned a little bit about renewable energy uh, and the future transition of semic includes uh, keeping this uh, renewability of the generation of energy and uh, i'd like to hear a little bit you mentioned a little bit the challenges but how you are preparing to keep this uh, renewability in your company uh, how you are preparing yourselves also for this transition yes uh, as, as the professor showed in the in his in at his study uh, brazil will increase and we need more energy providing of our system. Uh, now we are intent to to, uh, to focus on PV and in the wind solar power plant. But I think in the future we need to start to talk about uh, hydro power plant with reservoir to guarantee the resi resi resilience of our system. This is very important. It's an important discussion that we have to do because as, as, as much as we increase our, our PV, our wind power in our system, we need to increase the resilience. And to do this or with thermal, it's not the way nowadays, but we, we, should, we should and must do this with hydro power plant, with reservoir. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is challenging for not only the private sector, but also uh, for academic also to support us in this uh, analysis. So now moving to the end of this discussion, I'd like to hear a little bit from you both about the uh, discussions we've had from this uh, project from ACTDP, if you could comment a little bit on the lessons learned, uh, how you see the, the challenges that your sectors still need to address in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think it, it, this, 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 this project will be very useful for us. Uh, we believe that we are in a good pathway because we are renewable. We, we, are think, we, we are thinking that we are doing the correct things, but we're not. We are not sure. It's it's very important to have the, the outsourcing that are other people uh, saying, "Oh, yes, you are in a correct way or not." You need to. That you have the correct way, but you have some gaps that you need to deal with. Then I, I expect with the result of this program that will be in April, correct? Uh, the, oh, no, April not. Uh, oh, okay. Then, uh, then because uh, it's it's a very important uh, uh, input for our planning, our strategic planning. Then I think we will use this a lot, and it will be very important for us. Uh, SCDPs are very important uh, tool to the, the, for us. I think uh, ActDP is too uh, very very important too. For us, for us, it has it has been uh, uh, very interesting, and we have learned a lot because we. We have this framework, as I said. We have this framework now in which uh, we can base our growth, uh, or, or at least uh, uh, to keep an eye on, on, on how are we impacting uh, with, with our growth this. Um, but also, I think we have now like a mission, internal mission, uh, in the sense of um, trying to make this results or this message more clear to, to the rest of the world. Because, uh, as I said, we, uh, we live in this uh, entrepreneur startup e ecosystem 
in which things uh, tends to be really like fast and uh, with the with the urgency of growing in a very clear uh, uh, result oriented uh, uh, system so when you talk about uh, environmental assessment, then you get into this thing that tends to be highly complicated, at least in the eyes of the startup ecosystem that goes very fast. So we want to take this and try to explain, okay, yes, I mean, we can make it clearer. It, it, it's super important, it's, it's of the highest importance uh, on, uh, of, of what is happening in the planet. So we need to explain it in a more clear way for everybody to understand the importance of this. So it's not, it is not just an academic thing, it's a really something that it's, it's in the need of everybody. So we feel like we have that mission now, and we also want to share with our users and with our stakeholders and with everybody, because, because now we understand that, and that's thanks to the ACT assessment. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Vicente, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for your great contribution. I think that uh, from as a brief summary from your uh, your presentation, I think that apart from companies on commitments, it's also important to have these initiatives, these uh, opportunities for dialogues uh, on sector challenges and also future transitions that we need to overcome jointly. Uh, and now I'd like to pass for Ian for final words and conclusions of this session. So thank you. thank you very much. Actually, uh, yeah, a, a last few words just to conclude this event. So first, we, we really want to, to thank uh, the companies and all the stakeholders in the different countries that engage uh, within the, I mean, in the different conversation we, we had in a complicated period, as we, as we all know, and it was not that easy to, uh, to try to kickstart this project uh, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we really, uh, uh, really thank you to, to be part of the, of the project and all the stakeholders that have been invited in the different workshops in Brazil and Mexico, because uh, it was yeah, very complex. Um, and just to say that clearly one, I mean, and coming back a bit to the introduction, if you remember, of Stephanie, uh, Buzi Geishman from the FFM, saying that actually this is a pilot. This is really a pilot project that uh, we, have been, uh, uh, we have been done, and the objective is to try also to disseminate, uh, maybe replicate it uh, in other companies, replicate it in other subsectors, uh, in other geographies. So here you understood it was only in Brazil and Mexico, but this could be uh, uh, this could be applied and replicated in many different uh, parts of course of the world and as uh, as we know now that i think I, I just took a last note i think in the in the if you know the forbes global 2000 list you know of the main largest companies the 20% of the world largest companies in this list have now a net zero commitment and coming back a bit to uh, the announcement of the un uh, secretary general of saying we need to be able to assess and test the integrity of such commitment. I think that this project brings, uh, let's say, a, a step forward in that direction. And I, I hope that we will contribute with this pilot, replicating it maybe in other geographies and uh, being able uh, to test and, and ensure also that the net zero commitment of companies are consistent with the 1.5 path that we all need to, to follow. So uh, thank you all and I will just like to invite if we have uh, companies that are interested to learn and see how they could join uh, this uh, pilot project or the future work that could happen. So please uh, let's contact us and we will be glad to, uh, to follow with you. Thank you all and I wish you a good, uh, a good afternoon. What? If we, I mean, we just have three minutes left, I think, because there is another event that will just start in a few minutes. But if there is only, uh, we could take one question, let's say, if there are some in the audience. Uh, but maybe not. <laughs> so th so thank, thank you all and uh, wish you a pleasant, uh, pleasant day. <laughs>